Number 1. Borak was last seen at the Emeritus Assisted Living Facility, where he lived in the 1700 block of Northeast Indian River Drive in Jensen Beach, Florida on July 26, 2010. He walked out of the facility at around dinnertime that evening and never returned. He was supposed to be wearing a GPS tracking device on his ankle, but he cut it off before his disappearance. An extensive search of the area turned up no sign of him. He didn't have access to a vehicle, and there's no evidence that he purchased a bus or plane ticket. Prior to his retirement, Borak lived and worked as a carpenter in the local area for about 40 years. He had left the assisted living facility on several previous occasions and always went to his former home in Stewart, Florida. He was close to his four children and they spent a lot of time together. Borak's daughter stated he was physically healthy at the time of his disappearance, strong and a good swimmer. His children believe he's probably deceased and his body is in the local area. His case remains unsolved. Number 2. Boy was last seen at a bank in St. Petersburg, Florida on February 6, 1987. He purchased $1,500 in traveler's checks for an upcoming trip to South Africa. He has never been heard from again, and authorities confirm he never arrived in South Africa. His black and silver Chevrolet El Camino disappeared with him. A few days after Boyd disappeared, bank officials in Tampa, Florida, notified police that someone posing as Boyd was trying to refinance his truck and had taken $35,000 out of his accounts using false identification with Boyd's name and his own photograph. Police went to Boyd's home in the 1800 block of Nebraska Avenue Northeast in St. Petersburg. The house was built like a fortress, with an elaborate security system and no windows. The front door was unlocked and there were bloodstains in several rooms, as well as bullet holes, and spent .25 caliber cartridges in a wall and a mattress. Valuable items in the home, including firearms, jewelry, bottles of rare wine and object dart, were missing. There was no indication of Boyd's whereabouts. Boyd worked as a dealer in rare objects, traveling around the world to find things to sell. He dealt in gold, silver, ivory, rare coins and wines, objects dart, firearms, Nazi memorabilia and other items. He was a reclusive loner and lived frugally. Over two decades before his disappearance, he was convicted of second-degree murder after he shot his first wife's lover. Authorities determined Stephen Wayne White had tampered with Boyd's bank accounts and was driving his car. A photo of him is posted with this case summary. He has a long criminal history. He met Boyd by posing as a prospective buyer for Boyd's house, and the men became friends and then lovers. Investigators believe had been planning Boyd's murder for months, ever since he met Boyd's former girlfriend, Janina Koziage Mulhu, a naturalized French citizen. When they were arrested in June 1987, White and Melahu had a .25 caliber handgun, $10,000 in cash, Boyd's El Camino, and several hundred thousand dollars worth of his belongings. White's fingerprints were found in Boyd's bathroom as well. He was charged with murder, Mulhu only faced theft charges. At White's murder trial, his defense suggested Boyd, a bisexual transvestite, staged his own murder so he could get a sex change and start a new life as a woman. Mulhu pleaded guilty to grand theft and returned to France. White was convicted of murder and sentenced to life in prison, although prosecutors had sought the death penalty. In June 2015, he was charged with the murder of Cedric Horn, a retired dentist who disappeared from California in 1987. He pleaded guilty to second-degree murder in that case in October 2017. Horn's body, like Boyd's, has never been found. Foul play is suspected in both disappearances due to the circumstances involved. Number 3. Andrea was last seen in Lakeland, Florida on December 23, 1994. Her family members told authorities that she appeared to be distraught during the day of her disappearance. She had been married to John Edward Johnny Boyette for three months at the time. A photograph of John is posted with this case summary. Andrea told her relatives that her marriage was troubled. She wanted someone to accompany her when she picked up John after his work shift ended, but her loved ones were unable to make the trip. John told investigators that he and Andrea visited several bars along Cypress Gardens Boulevard in Winter Haven, Florida during the evening. He claimed that they returned to their rented house on Eastway Drive in Lakeland later that night. John stated that Andrea disappeared from their home while he was in the bathroom. Her three children, all of whom who were home on the evening of her disappearance, all contradicted this statement. Andrea has never been heard from again. Her grandmother reported her as a missing person on March 3, 1995, over two months after she disappeared. 
John claimed that he discovered Andrea's jewelry near their family's vehicle outside of their residence. Another relative said that the items were located on the front porch shortly afterwards. John apparently sold the majority of Andrea's valuables to local pawn shops, as his name was listed on the merchandise's receipts. He abandoned her children at their babysitter's home. John allegedly told a friend that he ran over Andrea with their car on the night of her disappearance. The statement has never been verified. John has a criminal record which includes charges of battery and domestic battery. He remarried after Andrea's disappearance and had a child. In February 2004, Andrea's son from a prior relationship, Dustin Cunningham, told investigators he had witnessed her murder in 1994. He was nine years old at the time. He stated that he saw John choke Andrea outside their home until she vomited, then he drove away with her and came back without her. Cunningham stated that John made him and his siblings clean up the vomit in the car. In June 2004, John's brother, Robert Boyette, confessed that he helped John dispose of Andrea's remains. He said they were weighted with chains and blocks and dumped in an artificial lake at the Norlin Mine, a phosphate mine in Bartow, Florida. John worked at the mine at the time Andrea disappeared. The lake has since been filled in with tons of dirt, and authorities do not believe they can find Andrea's body. In August 2004, a grand jury indicted John for second-degree murder in connection with Andrea's case. He has prior convictions for burglary and theft. His trial was scheduled to begin in May 2006, but days before jury selection commenced, John took a plea deal instead of going to trial. He pleaded no contest to manslaughter and was sentenced to eight years in prison. A no contest plea does not admit guilt, but acknowledges that there is sufficient evidence to convict the defendant at trial. John was paroled in October 2009. Andrea's loved ones said that it is uncharacteristic of Andrea to leave her children behind without warning. Foul play is suspected in her case due to the circumstances involved. Number 4 Kelly and her husband, Jake, were last seen on September 23, 2007. They left Miami Beach in Florida in Jake's 47-foot fishing vessel, the Joe Cool, with Jake's half-brother, Scott Gamble, a friend, Samuel Carey, and two others, Kirby Logan Archer and Guillermo Zarabozo. A photograph of the Joe Cool is posted with this case summary. They planned to take Archer and Zarabozo to the Bahamas to meet their girlfriends, then return to Miami the following day. Archer and Zarabozo paid them $4,000 for the trip. The Branhams, Gamble and Carey have never been heard from again. Photographs of Archer and Zarabozo are posted with this case summary. Between 4 o'clock and 5.45 p.m. September 24, Jake's uncle contacted authorities to say Kelly, Jake, Gamble and Carey had not arrived back in Miami as scheduled. They were expected to return no later than noon. Authorities discovered that a patrol boat had already located the Joe Cool at 6 p.m. on September 23, adrift in the Straits of Florida, 20 miles from Cuba, and nearly 160 miles off its course. There was no one on board. The boat was in disarray, and the life rafts were missing, it appeared as if the occupants had left hurriedly. A search was launched for the missing captain and crew. Zarabozo and Archer were found in a life raft at 9.45 a.m. on September 27, not far from where the Joe Cool had been located. They were rescued and questioned by investigators. Zarabozo was later charged with making false statements to a federal agent. Investigators discovered Archer had a warrant out for his arrest. In January 2007, he allegedly stole $92,000 from a Walmart store in Arkansas, where he had been an assistant manager. He was charged with unlawful flight to avoid prosecution. An extensive search turned up no sign of the others from the boat. On October 10, Archer and Zarabozo were charged with four counts each of first-degree murder, one for each of the missing individuals from the boat. Authorities stated both suspects made inconsistent statements. They could not agree how and when they met one another or what exactly happened on board the Joe Cool, and they could not provide any information about the girlfriends they planned to meet in the Bahamas. Zarabozo told investigators that three armed men had hijacked the boat and shot the Branhams, Carrie and Gamble. He said he threw the bodies overboard himself and cleaned up the mess. However, evidence aboard the boat contradicted Zarabozo's story. He claimed the victims had been all shot outside the cabin of the Joe Cool. Four spent 9mm bullet casings were located on the boat, but three were from inside the vessel's cabin. A blowgun with darts, knives, cellular phones and two pairs of leather gloves without fingers were found in a backpack on Zarabozo and Archer's life raft. Zarabozo later changed his story and said Archer had committed the shootings. 
In July 2008, after having asserted his innocence for nearly a year, Archer agreed to change his plea to guilty and testify against Zarabozo. In exchange, prosecutors agreed not to seek the death penalty against him, instead, he was sentenced to five terms of life in prison without parole. Archer stated he and Zarabozo had each killed two of the people on the ship. At Zarabozo's first trial, in 2008, a jury convicted him of weapons charges but could not reach a verdict on the other charges. The judge threw out those convictions due to faulty jury instructions. Zarabozo was retried and convicted of 16 charges, including the four murders, in February 2009. He was sentenced to five life sentences plus 85 years. He maintains his innocence, saying Archer committed the murders and threatened to kill him too if he told. Kelly and Jake have two children together. Jake is described as an experienced, very capable seaman. An extensive search of the ocean did not turn up any of the victim's bodies. Foul play is suspected in Kelly, Jake, Gamble and Carey's cases due to the circumstances involved. Number 5 Sabrina was last seen in St. Augustine, Florida, during the early morning hours of August 20, 2006. She resided on West 3rd Street at the time, and her home was under construction. She has never been heard from again. She was reported missing by her husband, Jimmy Brazel. Shortly after her disappearance, some of her belongings were found on West 4th Street. When Jimmy contacted authorities to report Sabrina's disappearance, they arrested him for domestic battery. Several days prior to going missing, Sabrina had told police Jimmy had kicked and punched her in their home. When investigators responded to her call, however, they were unable to find Jimmy. They did not locate him until he reported Sabrina as a missing person. Jimmy was eventually released from jail, but he was rearrested in 2007 for allegedly grabbing a woman off the street and raping her. He was interviewed about Sabrina's disappearance and is not referred to as a suspect, but authorities did search the Brazel home for her body. No evidence was located during the search. Sabrina had planned to move in with her daughter in Georgia, but she disappeared before the move. It's uncharacteristic of her to leave without warning. There have been numerous reported sightings of Sabrina in the Jacksonville, Florida area, but none of these have been confirmed. It's unclear whether the domestic violence incident is related to Sabrina's later disappearance, but Jimmy is considered a person of interest in her case and hasn't cooperated with the investigation. Her case remains unsolved and foul place is suspected. Number 6 Broughton was last seen at his home in the 3300 block of Marcus Drive in Pensacola, Florida at 5.30 p.m. on May 27, 1995. He told his grandson he was going into the backyard to check his garden and would be back in about half an hour. He never returned. Broughton's wife, who was watering the lawn at the time, saw him walking away from the house and went to get her shoes and car keys to follow him. A neighbor saw him try to get into a fence several doors down the street. Broughton then went behind some nearby homes by the railroad tracks. He may have been sighted under the viaduct near the J.E. Hall Center on Teekser Drive. He has never been heard from again. In spite of Broughton's Alzheimer's disease, he had no prior history of wandering away. Before his disappearance, he had been talking about moving back to Monroeville, Alabama. He was born there and still had relatives there, but lived in Pensacola for most of his life. An extensive search of the area turned up no sign of him. Broughton's family theorizes he was picked up by a passing motorist and taken out of town. Although he was easily confused, he had no prior history of wandering. His case remains unsolved.